Hi, I'm Larry Puckett, the DCC Guy. Today we're going to talk about five costly mistakes that many model railroaders make when they're first starting with model railroading. So let's go ahead and get started. So let's go ahead and start with the first mistake that a lot of people make, and that is starting without any kind of plan. Because it's very easy to get overexcited about the idea of building a model railroad or getting into model railroading, and forget about doing the research that's required to help you decide what prototype railroad you want to model and where you want to uh, place it, what kind of operations you want to do, all those kind of things. And there's just tons of information out there. I've got just many books like this. This one's on the Southern Railway. This one's on the Western Maryland. And they go into a certain amount of depth on the history of that railroad and its operations over time and give you a lot of photographs of the rolling stock, the locomotives, and the structures that were common to that railroad. And all of that is a very important part of developing a plan for where you want to go with your model railroad. Now one thing to keep in mind, you don't have to build a model railroad to be a model railroader. There are lots of train clubs around the country and you can just become a member of the train club, participate in construction operations there, and run some of your own rolling stock or locomotives at the club when you want to. You can also do that on a friend's layout. And I know a lot of people that basically operate that way and, and are model railroaders. But the vast majority of people, if you look back at Model Railroader and other magazines over time, the big thing is building a model railroad where you can enjoy the hobby itself in your house. So let's talk a little bit then about how do you proceed from there. Okay, so the second big mistake that people make is proceeding without actually developing a track plan. It's, it's very easy to get to, uh, trapped in a circumstance where you just go out to the hobby shop, buy a bunch of track and switches and the like, plop it down on a piece of four by eight foot sheet of plywood, for example, and create a model railroad. And that kind of thing, it can be fun at first, but if you're gonna get bored very, very quickly, I can tell you, just running trains around in a circle on a four by eight foot sheet of plywood. So that's where uh, the research up front that allows you to plan what you want to operate, how you want to operate, and how you want to do it uh, allows you to develop a track plan that's going to be useful to you. And there are a couple of different ways to do that. One thing, if this is your first model railroad, I highly recommend getting some of these books like this. And these are various books that have been published by Combuck over the years uh, showing different track plans. And some of these are collections of track plans that have appeared previously in Model Railroader. Some of them are their own independent uh, publications. So get these. Many of these are out of print now. They do have some in print as well that you can purchase either through Amazon or eBay or online at their uh, bookstore. You can also find older issues of these at various train shows. And those are a very good place to start looking. Some local libraries stock or have copies of older copies of these books. So go ahead, dig these out. In a lot of cases, you can actually find a track plan that you can begin with and experiment and learn before you commit yourself to building your model railroad empire that fills half your basement. Once you're ready to start planning, though, I highly recommend going with something like CADRAIL. CADRAIL is a program, computer program, that is designed specifically for designing model railroads. And I've been using it since about 1991. And let me tell you, when I got ready to build the Piedmont Southern here, the first thing I did when we moved into the house was I came down here to the basement and I measured the area of the room that I was going to be using for the model railroad. Highly detailed. And then I transferred that all to the computer. And I was able, after that, to design. I'm going to have to step back a little bit, and hopefully this will come into focus. This is the track plan that I developed and printed out in various sections, taped it together. 
And this is what I use because it allows me to design each and every piece of track that's going to be used on the model railroad. And then I can actually take measurements directly off of this, transfer them to the sheets of foam board or whatever you're using on your model railroad in order to create the landforms. I can lay my track out and it's going to be exactly like what I designed on the computer. And these various computer programs have files containing uh, turnouts that are the exact geometry of the real thing. So you know that when you put it down on a track plan, it's going to be the same when you transfer it to your layout itself. And that's the great thing about this. Plus, it allows you to experiment. You can put one configuration of track in here, move it around, see what fits best, and go with that. So you don't end up with crazy kinks and problems when you start laying your track. And this is one of the most costly things that you can run into, is getting involved with building a model railroad where you do not have exact, well-detailed plans. And you know, it can be frustrating at times to take all the time to do this, but it's very important that you do it. And that also is one of the great things about these various track plans in the books that I showed you because they give you a very good feeling for what the model railroad is going to look like once it's finished. And also, let me point out that you don't have to necessarily go with what they've done. You can take various track plans that appear in the magazine or in the book, and you can make color copies of those and do cut and paste operations. Mix and match and make them fit together, and then design your own track plan that way. Okay. Number three, another very, very important thing that can be very costly if you don't do it up front, and that is get the room that you're going to be using for your model railroad finished. Get it to the point where it is ready to live in because that's what you're going to basically be doing. I can't tell you how many model railroads I have visited where people basically have built a very nice model railroad, but they've got bare exposed concrete walls or bare sheetrock in the room. They've got an open ceiling with floor joists above or the attic ceiling above with pieces of insulation dangling down and falling on the model railroad. And I've seen model railroads built in garages that were not sealed and where dirt all the time was coming in every time that that garage door was opened. And that can be a real problem in a lot of areas. If you're out in California, there's not a lot of places out there that have basements. Same thing in Florida. And garages are a very popular place for building model railroads. And they can have a lot of problems with dirt and a lot of problems with heat and cold. So you get these expansion and contraction issues that can really be costly when it comes to your track work. Hit that little red uh, subscribe button. And when the little bell comes up, click on it and click all. Thanks now. So make sure, get your room ready to go. When I moved in here, this room was partially finished. The walls were up and covered, but they had not been painted and sanded and all of that. So you can look at this photo, you can see this is what the room looked like pretty much when I first got here. I had to finish all of the sheet rot work on the walls, get those sanded down and get the paint applied. And then after that, the next thing that was very important get your backdrops up, particularly if you're going to be building against a wall. Because putting a backdrop in after you have installed your track and structures and all of that is really a problem. It can be very, very damaging to the existing uh, structures and the like that you have put in already. So get that in. Don't forget your lights. Get those lights installed too. And that's where having a very accurate track plan is important. But of course, if you have a freestanding island type model railroad, then you've got a lot more flexibility with that because you can pull it out from the wall and then push it back in if you're going to have it against a wall. And you can add lighting above it later on. You can add lights, say, to a scenic divide that runs down the middle of the layout. So there's a lot of options that way. But if you're going to have a traditional around the walls type model railroad, get the walls finished, completed and get the backdrop installed. And you can see here the backdrop as I put into the Piedmont Southern. It is one continuous basically piece of masonite that goes all the way around the room. And I completed all the joints with 
are a joint compound, and I showed that in a previous video how I go about installing and finishing off the backdrop, and I'll include a link to that above me here. But get all of that done. Get your, get your backdrop installed, get your walls finished, get something in there for a ceiling so that you're not having dust and dirt sifting down on your model railroad all the time from above, and also get your lights installed. Those are critical before you really start building your model railroad. Now once you actually get started with building the model railroad, I know it is very, very easy to get carried away and start building and, and extending out. But let me tell you, one thing you really should think about doing is scenic as you go. Complete your track work in a given area and then do all the scenery work in that area because that's going to give you a nice completed scene where you can test the materials and the colors and everything else that you want to use and make sure that's going to fit in with the concept that you have for the model railroad. Uh, I'll show you this scene coming up and it was the first scene that I built here on the Piedmont Southern back in 2013 and it was basically a test of concept. I did the river crossing here, and I've shown you this before. And you can see I put in the river crossing, added the backdrop, added the photographic backdrop to it, and did all of the scenery. And that is what I'm using for the rest of the model railroad. So it gives me a starting point. Also, one thing that is very, very common with model railroads is folks will get carried away with building. They will build the layout, they will lay all the track, thinking that they'll eventually go back and add the scenery. And they end up with a model railroad that's never finished because they're just so busy running trains that they don't get started with actually finishing the scenery. So there's a lot of model railroads that I've seen around this country that are like that. They, they never get past laying the track and running the trains. And I think that's something you need to plan as part of your overall approach to building a model railroad. Don't get caught in the trap of just building track and running trains. Now, the next thing in line is dealing with how you're gonna control the trains. Are you gonna use AC power? Are you gonna use DC power? Are you gonna use DCC? Or are you gonna use something like the new Blue Nami uh, methods that are available? because all of those are very important considerations to make. Because once you make a decision, you need to pretty much stick with it. It is possible to convert from one to the other, but it can be very costly for you to go back and do that. Because in some cases, you're going to have to tear old stuff out, put new stuff in, and go from there. And that can be very expensive. For example, right now, the new Blue Nami technology is something that is very appealing to me. However, I've got over 60 locomotives down here that have regular decoders in them. So I really can't tear all those out and replace them with Blue Nami decoders. The cost would be prohibitive. So I'm pretty much trapped, but you know, that's one of the uh, aspects of this. You have to realize that there might be some things that actually come along down the road that are very appealing to you and really, you can't go chasing after the latest, newest technology that comes popping out. Sometimes you just have to make a commitment. And also, when it comes to command stations and boosters and things like that, once you pick a specific brand, I advise you to stick with it. Because let's say you decide to buy a Digitrack Zephyr. Well, then you can add boosters to that, but stick with Digitrack's components. Because although it is possible, to operate various other manufacturers' equipment with other brands, because it is DCC. In the long run, you're going to find out that the various components are designed to work together. And another reason I suggest picking a system early is that as you build a section of your model railroad, fire it up, test it, make sure that it works with your equipment as you go. Then as you build out and add more wiring and more track, test it test as you go. Because if you think that you're going to be able to build even a four by eight foot layout or something like that, and then flip the switch and it's going to work the way you expect it, don't bet on it because it won't. So you need to test as you go. And basically that's true of anything you do down on a model railroad. Now finally, I'm going to add a sixth one here. And that's sort of a wrap it up type of thing. And that is develop a long-term plan. 
be aware of what it's going to take to actually build a model railroad. Because if you're building something on a four by eight foot scale, that is one thing. Assume two to five years to do that. If you're going to build a big basement filling empire, figure at least 10 years if you're doing it by yourself. And, you know, try to recruit other people to help you because there's a lot of stuff that you can do as an individual, but there's a lot of things that you can get done a lot faster if you have a regular crew helping you out. Well, that's a wrap for today's video. I hope I've shared with you some valuable tips that will get you started on the road to developing your own model railroad at a cost that's not going to break your bank. So go ahead, go out, grab some books at your local hobby shop or possibly at a train show and get started with planning your model railroad. Learn a lot about the prototype that you want to actually model and get started on that road to a model railroad. Also, don't overlook the online resources that are available at the Model Railroader website itself. If you have a subscription, I'm pretty sure you'll have access to their online database of track plans that have been published previously in Model Railroader. And they're a very valuable resource themselves. So, have a great weekend, have a great week, and we'll see you here next week with another video from the DCC Guide. Bye now.